three magical words when you face this resistance during a call. And those words are visit, fit, and value. And if you can finesse those three words into a call once you start meeting resistance, but it'll turn, it'll hopefully turn around that call and get you that meeting. I think that you're just literally going through every page, picking a number and calling it um, almost as automated robocalls. But I think through recruitment, like I alluded to before, it really built that that resiliency of getting pushed back and said no to. And, and part of that resiliency and part of that process was going, all right, what's my sales story? Welcome to Growth Pulse, the B2B sales podcast. You might be a salesperson. You could lead a sales team. Maybe you're in a business or you're a battle-tested entrepreneur. Then we built this podcast for you. Great salespeople are built, not born. We learn so much from the deals we win, but we learn even more from the deals we lose. In each episode, we bring you some of the world's leading salespeople, sales leaders, and experts in sales tech to share their best lessons from both their wins and their losses. Before we start, Please check out the screen of your phone or laptop, and if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you've clicked subscribe and press that like button down below. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, click the plus sign to follow so we can let you know when we publish each new episode. If you like the episode, drop us a comment with any questions about the show. We'd love to get to know our audience. Great businesses always feature world-class salespeople, and the best salespeople are always learning. So let's jump in. Welcome back to another episode of Growth Pulse, the B2B sales podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Dan Bartels, here with my uh, ever trusty, I was going to call you sidekick, Dan, but that's not quite fair. That's no, interesting. Mate, welcome back. Thanks, Thanks a bit cooked for the last couple of weeks. Are you feeling better? Yeah, I'm much better, mate. I've had these big events. I went to a kickoff in Vegas, brought some COVID home, and then went to Salesforce World Tour and bought Influenza A home. So... Twice in the space Amazing. of four weeks. <laughs> Back them up. Absolutely. I'm done and now. mate, we've got one of your great colleagues. Ralph, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be here. All the way from not so sunny Radelaide. Radelaide, mate. I haven't, look, I, I, I love Adelaide. I, I haven't been down there for uh, probably 12, 18 months. But even just the, the, the size of the town, it's just, it's nice. It's, you can handle it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's great yeah, food. Pun- absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, we're doing some recruitment at the moment and, and all of the, I think 80% of the candidates we've got all happen to be in Adelaide. So tell, no one's, oh, I have no idea. I'm not part of this particular recruitment, but I just heard that anecdote yesterday. So there's a, there is a real wealth of, of knowledge and, and technology in particular down in Adelaide. So yeah, that's excellent. Mate, look, I, I don't want to still, you know, want to, want to make sure we jump in, but we, we've got an exciting topic for everyone today, which we're talking about prospecting. And I want to give you a moment, just give everyone a bit of your background, what you've done. So, mate, give us kind of the, the 10 cent tour. Yeah, look, it's, where do I start? I'm a financial accountant by trade. So you wouldn't have thought by my personality from you've met me for the rest of the time we spent together. But I started off my career as a financial accountant, did that at uni and did the job as that for six months and realized I, I, I didn't love it. So I, I had that crossroad moment in my career where I thought, what, what am I going to do next? And so I... It was on seek as you do. And I saw this job that came up called IT candidate manager. And I was like, all right, great. I'll apply for it. Went to the interview, wore a suit. It was on level 23 of our tallest building in Adelaide. And I thought, awesome, this is baller. Got the job, <laughs> rocked up. And I said, holy crap, I still don't know what this job is, but I'm here. And it turns out it was, a, it was an IT recruitment job. So I, I cut my early, very early sales career as an IT recruiter. And for those that are listening, and those of you that know, recruitment is a, it's a cutthroat industry as a seller. It's not easy. And it's something where you probably, you know, it, the next best uh, feeling is those guys in the street that are trying to get you to donate to charity. The amount of times you get said not to and not interested, but it really builds that resiliency. I did that for about six or seven years. By the end of it, I was a director of a local recruitment company called Graythorn. Shout out to Graythorn, who doesn't exist anymore. But uh, a local IT services company, I was, and the funny story is they actually brought me in to, to pitch them. And I actually left that pitch meeting with pretty much a job offer to come join them. They were, they were a little cloud startup who, it was four of them at the time or five of them, sorry. And when they, when we started speaking, they were like, Hey, how about you come work for us? I, I joined them and I had five very good years with them selling all sorts of IT stuff. It was my real first stint in IT in Adelaide in services, hardware, software, and then through that time, I sold a lot of Veeam. And by the end of that career, I, the guys at Veeam said they were starting up shop in South Australia and it was the right time in my life to, to join them. And here we are. 
Yeah, a round circle. So look, my my career in sales has not been a straight line, but I guess I think everyone can agree that sales is not a straight line. I think we all started off growing up saying we wanted to be astronauts or lawyers or accountants. I don't think any one of us said, I want to be a salesman growing up. And God, if my son comes to me one day saying he wants to be a salesman, I'll be very concerned. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a bit about my journey. A lot of people in my working career who have started their sales career or their business journey in recruitment and have really learned how to count, round out their skill set. It's a hard slog. It's high competition. Uh, there are, uh, your differentiation is just based really on with, whether you've got a detailed structure in your organization, often, often differentiation is yourself. We want to talk about prospecting today, which Simon joked before we've hit the record button that of all the episodes we've done so far, we, prospecting is a really critical piece of sales, right? And we haven't talked about it. So it's, it's timely that we do. Absolutely. Yeah. Talk to me about you know, your experience in that recruitment space and how you learned prospecting and I suppose what you think is really important in that. Yeah, look, absolutely. I think, I mean, in all of my stints in recruitment, I was working for a relatively new team. There was no strategic account list. There was no named account list that we're all so used to and get these days. I was literally picking up the phone book and dialing for dollar, right? I think you're just literally going through every page, picking a number and calling it um, almost those automated robocalls. But I think through recruitment, like I alluded to before, it really built that, that resiliency of getting pushed back and said no to. And, and part of that resiliency and part of that process was going, all right, What's my sales story? What's my value proposition? And what's going to get me, what's going to get my prospects listening to me and taking the meeting? Because at the end of the day, the, the purpose of a prospecting session is not to, it's not to, yes, yes, the long-term goal is to get the opportunity, but, and to eventually qualify. But the purpose of prospecting is to get the meeting. I think that's as simple. It's as simple as that. It's really that, that simple method of getting that meeting, having a bit of resistance on that call and really when, once you get that meeting, that's when you can start to qualify out and that's when you can start to do discovery and, and get those opportunities as well. For me, with prospecting, it's, it's a mindset thing. You've really got to set yourself up. You're not, uh, if I think about nowadays where I do have a strategic list and a named account list, it's, you've got to change that mindset. You're not calling, you're not calling to bother uh, someone. You're actually calling to help them win and you're whole, calling them to help them succeed and, uh, and, and actually add value to their organization. And I think that's the, probably the critical mindset that you need to have with prospecting, but look, clearly I could go on for hours about this topic. Happy to dive a bit deeper into something specific and go from there. So I think that the question that I've got, you mentioned mindset. How do you, what sort of a mindset do you bring even now to prospecting? I know what I do, what I look at, which is I've either been given a list or I've targeted a particular, a couple of customers that I want to jump into and have a conversation with. And my mindset is always about. I know they've got a problem because that's why I'm in a particular market selling a, selling a product or a solution. And the fact that they even made it to my list in the first place means that it's likely that they are, they've got a problem that I need to come up and resolve. If it's recruitment, hey, one of the biggest issues for people, for, for organizations or leaders is you're going to have turnover. The first day that you employ someone is the longest period they're ever going to work for your business. Or at some point that person's leaving or you're expanding or like, there's always this need. So... They've got a need that I can help solve. And how do I help them to understand potential for it or the issues they don't, they don't understand themselves? But, you know, th that's my story. What's the mindset that you bring to prospecting and how do you coach people on that as well? Yeah, look, that's a great question, uh, Dan. Look, for me, the mind, it all starts with the mindset, right? It's, let's face it, no one wants to pick up the phone. Even now, picking up the phone is it's a hard thing to do, going out of your way to, to bother someone the day that someone picks up the phone and goes, oh my God, Ralph, I was so happy you called. My thing that, I, that you sell just broke. Great. I love to see you. That's never going to happen, right? It's just not, that, not the reality. Never. So for me, I think you've got to have, exactly, look, you've got to have that mindset and you've got to, have to think about your why, right? I think the, there is a lot of adage around the why, so I don't want to overplay that because everyone talks about that. But you've really got to think about from your perspective, what's your sales story and what's your purpose? And, and from that, what's the value that you believe that you're adding to that organization. So I, I feel like your mindset going into every call really should be one, believing in the product that you sell, but two, really is, it really is believing that you're here to solve, like you said, Dan, you're here to solve that problem for the customer and that your product or your service can help them do that. And that really is, it's as simple as that. I think we all get 
so distracted by, oh, my mindset is, oh, I'm behind number or I have no pipeline or, you know, and that we all know you can sniff that type of salesperson from a mile away when they call. And I think when mm. you do come across that genuine mindset of I'm here to help you, I know I can help you and I believe I can, that creates a lot more different type of tone in your voice, as simple as that, but also just the, the intention that you bring to that call. The people we speak to, let's face it, the people we speak to are executives for the most part. Certainly for me, I've always tried to focus on the executive because they're the ones with the decision-making authority, but also the power of their wallet. They're human beings as well. And I think if you tell yourself that they're a human being and they've got things that keep them up at night, really, it, it almost makes that conversation a lot easier. Absolutely. Hey, Ralph, as you went through your career and you obviously done software, hardware, service and sales, you sold people. Obviously, you don't just pick up the phone and randomly start a, a conversation with a prospect. Tell me a little bit about how you prepared for a call. You've got a prospect, you're going to make a, a cold call in, or you've got some information. You want to talk to the executive. How do you go about preparing for that conversation? Yeah, look, that, that's an excellent question. And I think for me, I'm not loathe, but the term cold calling for me, especially for us in the type of sales we do, it should never be a cold call. To your point, Simon, there should be always be a level of preparation for that call because once you once you've realistically you've got that real first 30 seconds of that call to capture that prospect's attention, right? You really need to be able to mm -hmm. bring almost that 30 second elevator pitch to the call very early because that's what will get them attention. Because what's our knee jerk reaction when we get that call from that random person that's tried to call us? It's a, oh my God, I'm going to hang up on you, get lost uh, type yep. thing. I think we all know those times where we've got that really good phone call from someone and we go, oh my God, I'm actually going to listen to this person on the other side of the line. But I think from a preparation perspective, to, to bring it back to that point, Simon, it's really about looking into one, what that business does, any news, any tidbits, any sort of articles on that business. It's really almost stalking them and, and understanding very clearly what value and what your product or service is going to do for that customer or prospect, right? So it's LinkedIn, mm -hmm. it's the interwebs. It's speaking to LinkedIn. I think a, a very underused feature on LinkedIn is looking at mutual connections, speaking to the mutual connection that you of that prospect and going, Hey, tell me about this guy. Do, what do you know about them? Or in, in our space, Alliance Technologies, Hey, you've sold a whole bunch of servers or networking into there. What do you know about them? And then really, it's really set you up for success with that call. In, exactly. And they go, great, Ralph. They're really going to be like, great, you actually done your research and I'm more likely to talk to you. And secondly, take that meeting. Yeah, I think Ralph, one, one of the things as you were talking through that, that I was thinking back through my prospecting experiences and also some of the feedback that I've had from others. And in fact, it's funny, I was talking to my dad about this the other day. He's a solicitor, right? And so nice. they don't think about prospecting at all. It's an, it's a necessary part of the business, right? Often think about prospecting as I'm going to get a list and I'm just going to call from start to finish and I just churn through those and I allocate one hour and then it's, I pull the band that off and it's finished. But <laughs> you made the comment there about you had those calls where all of a sudden this particular unexpected phone call or engagement kind of penetrates your own shield and your reaction as an individual is quite different to the rest of the calls you get. I mean, you'll get random calls. I get called by, from the RSPCA twice a week, probably. And, and sometimes they get me good news, sometimes they don't. But it's that call where all of a sudden someone is phoning you. Like you yes. actually straight away feel like this person is phoning me with a purpose. I'm not part of a list. It's because, hey, it's a mutual connection referred us to each other that they know about my business and they think that they should phone me because this is important and I should understand about it. I had a great one many years ago from a company that Simon and I ended up using a, a data analytics company called HG Insights. And they were using the so, that, so they pull a whole bunch of information about contacts and who works for who and data around what software products you use, which is really relevant for us. And I would get an email once every other day from a company offering similar services. Yet they used their product and they, they filtered right through all the noise and, and came through and said, hey, Dan, we know this is the business that you're in. We know these are the problems you've probably got. And this is how we think we can help you. That was in the first 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. said, look, this is a cold call, but we'd like to have a conversation with you. Can we set up a minute? And I was like, actually, yeah. <laughs> They're all the problems that I genuinely yeah. have. And you awesome. know about me and you've given me a little bit of insight in the first 35 seconds. 
And you've been really clear about what your ask was, which is we just want to have a phone call. And if that's not okay, it's not the right time now, great, move on. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that's the piece you, you mentioned before, which is it's that how do you penetrate that shield and make it a personal conversation, not just a rope, I'm just going to keep smiling and dialing till someone says, oh my God, you phoned me the exact right moment when I needed to press purchase on your particular product. Yeah. How, how do you build this? Like how? And I think for all three of us, right? How do we build that skill for ourselves, but for our teams? Mm. Yeah, Simon, maybe you want to go yeah, as the manager. Was. Funny, it's look, it's an interesting one. I think, you know, first and foremost, you've got to be genuinely curious about who you're calling. If you're just calling and it comes across as talking to you today is part of my job, and I've got to tick a few boxes, it's bleedingly obvious, right? So, I think that genuine curiosity and empathy. Something interesting you said, Dan, I think persistence is also key. I think you're not necessarily going to have the, the cut through call on the first communication. So it's, it's really important. Um, if it's not a good time or you do, it's just not resonating, don't give up. I think if you, if you're genuinely curious about solving a problem for a prospect and you, you do believe it, I think the second and third communication typically in my experience people go all right they're being persistent it wasn't just a list ticking a box maybe they do have something i should probably listen to and i'll give them the time of day and i guess the other interesting piece and you mentioned it before dan is the first 30 seconds it is so important because if if we're all busy typically have a spreadsheet open and my emails open call comes in and i've got one eye on the, the spreadsheet or the email and the other one sort of semi listening to the call. And if that sort of first 30 seconds actually resonates with me and it's about me or a problem that I probably have, I'm curious. And and that's what you want to try and elicit. But I know Ralph, what do, what do you think, mate? Yeah, look, I think, yeah, absolutely. We, I think we've spoken about that opening, but I think the most important, another really important thing is you are going to face resistance. I think you've got to, you've got to expect that punch the land where they say, not interested. I did a lot of my prospecting, my best prospecting during COVID when people were like, I can't meet you. It's COVID. We don't have money. We don't have projects. Mm. You have to have that level of resistance. And I think like, to, to add to that, and if I give a shout out to my, my, my old boss, my former boss, he was a, we were, he taught us a lot of principles around from a gentleman named Mike Weinberg. And I recommend any upcoming or any existing seller to look at up a gentleman called Mike Weinberg and uh, for him, he talks about three magical words when you face this resistance during a call. And those words are visit, fit, and value. And if you can finesse those three words into a call, once you start meeting resistance, it'll turn, it'll hopefully turn around that call and get you that meeting. The word visit, we visit our parents, we visit our friends in hospital, we visit our friends on the weekend. It's a, it's not a, it's a non-threatening word. But then when you use words like fit and, and, and value, it's using it as an example going. Hey, Mr. Cuthbert, I know you're busy. I know it's COVID. If, you, if I give 20 or 30 minutes of your time, we can see if we're a fit for each other. And I think that's also really important to say fit for each other, not if we're a fit for you, because that customer may not necessarily be a fit for you as an organization, right? I think we've had to qualify our customers who aren't right for us or a match for what we do as a business. So talking about, hey, I'd love that meeting to see if we're a fit for each other. And then great, look, if it doesn't lead to anything, if there's no next steps, I guarantee you'll get some at least some value out of that meeting from the insights we'll talk about. And that usually they go, all right, cool. They go, wow, you've been persistent. I liked you. I liked your opening. You've clearly, you clearly think I'm important. You've picked up the phone to me. And I think if you finesse those three words or something similar to what I think you'll get the meeting. And if I go back to what I was saying at the start, the purpose of a prospecting call or a cold call is to get the meeting, right? It just, it's as simple as that because you qualify them out. If the discovery goes wrong, great, but at least you've got that meeting and you can stop focusing on them if they're not for you then and there. That's a good, that's a good model. And I think that sort of talks to a lot of the things that I've experienced in my career. And I've, I've got some great just individual stories of when I excelled in prospecting and others were pretty ordinary. And I think back to I, I a couple of things as well. So I, I've, there's a great guy called Mark McInnes who's written a book and it's for the Australian market versus the international markets and understanding that it, it's, and you mentioned before, Simon, it's not unlikely to be the first engagement you've had with someone or the first time they've seen you where instantaneously you're a great fit and we're off to the races. And it might take stalking them for a bit on LinkedIn. When I say stalking, it's 
liking their posts, commenting. Yeah, yeah. You might have out, you might have re- reached out, tried to connect to them. So now, now when they get a phone call from you, and it may not be in the same week, it may be over a period of time. There's now some sort of name recognition. Oh, hold on, I, I know Ralph. Hey, yeah, Ralph, what's this about? So this that's building up this sort of baseline. But then there is like this clear piece, which is I'm making this concept of an unreasonable request. And it's unreasonable because they can't justify the value from this investment of time on day one. It's unlikely they're going to get true value back from a meeting. You're making the promise of it, and there's no way that they can know ahead of time whether it will happen or not. So I've got a request. I want a meeting. People tend to actually like to offer to honor requests. Yeah. People like yeah. to grant them. You you want absolutely. But you think someone says, "Can I have some of your time in your team?" You want to give, them, but just be really clear what you're asking for. And I'll say yes. Well, I say no. They say no. That's okay. No problems. We move on. Mm-hmm. And if it's no, is let's just double check. Is it is that day? Is is this week just a bad time for you? Is this quarter? Yes. Is there a better way to do it? And then not walk. Away. Hey, are you not the right person to talk to? That could all be the same case as well. And then, but then also be really clear as to them what they're going to get back from that. Mm. Hey, look, out of our time, I want to make sure that and you said, look, are we a fit? Is there something we should explore here? But I'm clear that at the session you'll walk away with these types of insights about your organization. Correct. Other thing that mix that I think people miss as well is nobody actually wants to know about your product. Everybody yep. too often sales people think what a customer is intrigued about is your product and what you're going to sell to brainwave no. they don't care <laughs> it's, yeah it, 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 it's not right <laughs> yeah they want to know about themselves so i mean i'll, I'll, I'll use the example and i hope you can listen to this i'll use the example of my dad's my dad's legal practice right they want to know about hey you're in this particular type of business and these are the type of legal problems or issues that we're seeing that people like you are having right. These are some really interesting changes that have happened in the marketplace might impact you next. And what you're doing is, or if we're talking about security software, or if we're talking about FX, it's, hey, look, this is what we've seen happen, that this is the evolution of technology. These are what people are in, in your chair are looking at right now. And if they walk away with those things, all of a sudden you're a trusted advisor. All of a sudden, you're giving them value, and you've got to promise those things before they give you. Otherwise, 100%. why are they taking the session? I've got stuff to do. Yeah, but I think a lot of that comes from a lot of that knowledge. I've been selling for what am I now? Forty three. I've been selling since I was eighteen. What's that? 20, 25 wow. years, right? Wow. A lot of that's come from learning this the hard way. How do we teach it to others? How do we teach it to the people in our teams or junior salespeople who haven't had twenty five years or more experience? Like. How do we break it down for them so they can really start to tackle this problem? Look, for me, again, just going back to just principles I've learned over my career, it's very simple. You just got to break it down. I use these three letters to really help down what our job as a salesperson is, right? So the three letters are C, A, C, and those stand for create, which is prospecting, advance the deal, which is obviously watering the deal, moving it along, creating deal velocity as my as my former uh, manager told taught me and then C is for closing. It, it's really, if you can really master those three things and really your whole week during the nine to five that you just work should revolve around those three things. If you're not doing those three things, you're, you're wasting time. So I think in terms of going back to your question down about how do we teach juniors, it's about going at the end of the day, as a salesperson, we own the tip of the funnel, right? Like it, it all comes back to us. You, you can't you can't, you can't hide from the fact that our job is to make money, right? It's to make revenue and make profit for the respectable businesses that we work for. So prospecting mm-hmm. is the only prospecting and creating pipeline. It's the only way we can survive in this job. So it's really, and I, I would just go to a lot of the juniors and, and this is by no offense to some of the, the modern salesperson or the junior salespeople, but in, in a tough time, what are you going to do? Are you going to put more LinkedIn posts up? Are you going to put more tweets out? I'm curious to know like what you're going to do if that's your model of selling. Is that what you're going to do if you're struggling, if you've got no pipeline? But it's really encouraging that. Look, great. And this is by no means saying that picking up the phone is the only way to be successful. It's using everything at your, at your discretion, right? It's using mm-hmm. LinkedIn. It's using email. Hell, use Twitter. I recruited someone off Twitter once. It's one of my, my, my favorite stories is I found someone on Twitter. Thankfully, they were a real person. 
that that worked out. But I think really it's about foundations. I think prospecting is really all about how you create that pipeline and, and pipeline is how you survive. So. And I think Ralph, thinking through, you, you also need to know that not every prospecting call is going to be successful. And I've seen a yes, lot of junior correct. salespeople be persistent, which you love, be curious, which I love. How the flip side is they're not willing to let it go. So they'll burn half a day or days on end trying to get to a particular company and that company's just not interested and they just don't know when to let it go and move on to the next one. So I think you've also got to be very pragmatic and a little bit brutal sometimes about your time because not every company you think you've got the best solution for is A, going to be ready for it, B, going to listen to you. And you just, you also need to know when to move on. And that's a key yeah. part of it as well. But the point of using your time effectively, that's really what it's all about. I see, I see a lot of newer sellers. They spend hours and hours doing what we spoke about before, guys, was preparation. They spend so much time researching a, a prospect and obsessing over them and then keep pushing the call out and why it burns so much time preparing for the prospect. And I think part of what I would teach upcoming salespeople is value your time. But what I used to always call it the, the platinum hours, like that nine to five when you're at work, those are the platinum hours. That's when you should be doing the key sales activities that I was speaking about before. All that preparation we were just talking about, that should be done in your own time if you can. Because when you're in those golden hours or platinum hours, it, that's when you should be doing the prospecting activities and the advancing and closing of deals. The great point, Simon, is that it's, we've got enough. There's so many distracting things in this job. And, and often we will opt to, to do the easier thing. We'll go check that email. We'll go put that fire out. We'll go do that quote. It's often easier to do the easy thing in this job. So I think you've really got to make that time, whether it's blocking an hour out or blocking time out every day in your calendar to do it. And you just got to commit to it. It's an appointment for yourself. Like any appointment you would have with a customer or with a prospect, you've got to honor that meeting. Absolutely. And I think, hey, hey I'm curious, Dan, as well. You, you just mentioned time, Ralph, and the, the platinum hours. When is a terrible time to prospect? When should you be prioritizing other things? Definitely Friday afternoon is not a good time to prospect. I think that's a yes, yeah, thing I, we can all agree. I, I think all that's a mistake, though. I, I, I think there's a, people try and find like the optimum time mm. and there, there isn't one. And, it's true. And that's the point true. of me saying there isn't one is if my week, if my Friday's chock a block, I don't know, maybe I've got an all day session with a client. It's the wrong day, but maybe that's on Monday. Maybe it's on Tuesday. Maybe my schedule is I'm in the car between eight and 10, but that's mine. Hey, Simon, you ride a motorbike, so don't try and get me on the motorbike. <laughs> it's not that. It's, yeah, exactly. It's a long time to get <laughs> Yep. So I, I, th I don't think there's a right or a wrong time. Can you work out for your particular market? Do people behave in a certain way? Yeah, possibly. Mm. I, again, if you're selling to a legal fraternity and you're selling to barristers, well, the court starts at 10 and goes to three. So don't try them between 10 and three. They're probably in court, mm -hmm. right? If you're, if you're in the selling to, to, to doctors, normally your doctor's surgery will have dedicated, look, these are the hours that the doctor doesn't take patients and they'll take calls then. So you have to, under, every practice is different. So like, I, th I think there's a piece there to understand it, but I also think, and you mentioned earlier, looking at the distant side of, of when we're selling to a prospective client or we have to get into a particular door. I think one of the pieces that we've all, we see so often in, in not just junior sales, but in general, is when they've fallen back on, I'm now trying to sell you my product. And the customer says, I'm not interested in your product because I know about it, care about it, it's not a problem right now. I've never had a customer or a prospect that doesn't want to talk about themselves. We can just have mm. never had it. It might be the person you're trying to get a hold of right now is, dude, I've got a billion things on. Um, this is, I don't have time. Sorry. It doesn't mean that there isn't someone that works for them, someone that works alongside them. Mm -hmm. Isn't the right contact for you to have a conversation and say, hey, I just want to understand about your business. Can I come and buy your coffee to, part of my job is to sell to you. You're in my target list. Okay, cool. Mm. I want to just learn more about your company because you might have money fit there is somebody in that i don't care if it's a receptionist who will take the call and or will take the meeting and will give you 20 minutes to tell you all because they're excited that someone wanted to talk to me about this business that i spent all my time and my effort in and of course i want to tell you about our business I'm, i love our company 
I spend all, yeah. I, I go to parties with these people. Like people will talk about their business all the time. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. If you try to your product, I don't care. I'm not interested in that. Interesting one, Dan. I think, um, you know, Ralph and I were in a, um, a prospecting meeting oh, a few months ago and, um, you know, it was with the CIO of a government agency and we sat down and yeah. He, he knew why we were there and he'd taken the call and Ralph had obviously done a great job of getting the guy interested in enough to sit down and have a coffee with us. And it's, it wasn't a phone call. It was a face to face, but he sat down and said, so guys really happy to meet with you. I just got no budget for what you're selling. So he referenced our product and said, I have no budget to buy what you're selling within the first two and a half seconds, literally as we sat down, we then interestingly to your point dan didn't talk about us we didn't go oh but you don't really understand my widget is it's got gold plated xyz's on it and it's going to solve every problem you've ever had we, we actually turned the conversation around and said so tell me about what's going on with you where are you spending your time and this person was the cio what's going on in you know the, the it world for you and very quickly very there are three or four key pain points that he'd never associated with what we were wanted to talk about. But we probably spent 45 minutes talking to him and about 10 seconds talking about our product. Our goal out of that was to empathize with his problem, understand the scale of the problem and what, what it would mean to him to solve that problem, both in monetary terms, reputational terms, within his organization. And what we were able to do after that is set up a follow-up meeting to explain how we might be able to solve a particular major embarrassing issue that organization was suffering. And um, yep. what became abundantly clear um, was don't talk about your product. Talk about the problem you're going to solve. Yep. Talk mm. about something that matters to your audience. And it's, it doesn't matter how yep. many times in your career that happens to you, but when it is that obvious and it hits you in the face, you just keep getting reminded, don't talk about your product. Talk about the problem you're going to solve. Always. Yeah, customers. Yeah, I, I'm just yeah. I'm consistently reminded. Customers don't buy your product. They buy a solution to their problem. Yep. And if you haven't yep. been able to work out what their problem is, that's why they haven't bought your product yet or your service. Or what it is. Yep. It's amazing the number of people who will come back to me after years and say, oh, you're in this space right now. Their experience of business that we've done in the past is they brought a problem to me and we solved the problem. Hey, look, I think you might be in this area where with the job you're doing right now, this is the problem that I've got. Is Do you guys fix that issue? Mm. Yeah, we or no, we don't talk to these guys. Yeah. Great, not a problem. Oh, we don't. We have a, some, we do, do some business or we don't or they get referred to somebody else. Yep. But key piece is they'll come back not because they like the color of the widget that I'm selling or the people that I've got in the team that do the service. Yeah. It's, hey, listen, I've got this problem. How do I solve this problem? 100%. And, 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 and pricing, absolutely. right? The, the bane of every salesperson's existence. If you go and sell a widget, they're going to ask you how much the widget is. And too early in a sales cycle, you talk about the price of the widget. You're basically well behind in terms of where you need to be. And I think, love your quote, Dan, that I've heard many times, if my product's going to cost $100 million, that sounds really expensive. But if I've got a $150, $200 million problem and I'm focused on a $200 million problem, price of my product is irrelevant. Yeah. So is irrelevant? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. If I, I, I'll think of this way. If I'm going to make you a billion dollars, do you care if you pay me a million? No. no. I couldn't care less. Exactly. <laughs> but if I'm going to make you $5 and it costs a million, you're not going to buy it. No. Un yeah. Unless there's a critical problem that you have to fix this. So the roof's going to fall on my head and I have to pay the million bucks. Yep. But it, even then, the million dollar problem is I'm going to die if this roof falls on my head. So what's the problem behind this? Mm -hmm. Price is net. Price is never the reason someone doesn't do it. It's always a fact. And this goes back to prospecting as well. The reason someone doesn't take the meeting with you, it's a sale. In, but what they're spending is their time for the next thing. They're not spending cash yet. So they're going to spend time, effort, or money with you. And it could be money. It might be if, they're, if their time's billable, I've got to equate the fact that if I spend time with you, I'm not earning money over here. Okay, maybe. It could just be the fact that I've got to travel to you. It could be the fact that I've got to mentally eject myself from whatever I'm doing next to spend time with you. It could be the effort of uh, 
actually bringing people into my office. I've got to, I'm we're on the 17th floor and I've got to walk downstairs. I've got book time. If all that's too difficult, we'll just do a, we'll do a video call. Great, no problems. How do I resolve it? Can I talk to somebody? Can I talk to your PA? Can I talk to the reception girl and, and remove all that risk from you? So this is really simple and easy. But they're gonna they're gonna make a purchase to spend that time with. It's a small it's a small investment, but I, I just understand that. And, and what's the hurdle they're gonna have to jump to spend time and effort with you? Yep, mm. so that's my opinion. Yeah. Ralph, you're the Love expert, it. mate. You approach the evolution from recruitment into selling tech and, and selling secure and stuff. How have you evolved your prospecting approach? Like, yeah, look, I think going to a going all the way, like you said, to name to counter of focus, it's and having that foundation of dialing through the phone book or, or just calling randoms, going from that to a highly focused approach really naturally helped me sharpen that that sword as well. But to your guys' point before, obviously the prospecting piece, but then the meeting piece, it's I, I remember when I was a when I was a young'un or a or a rookie, it's spending that meeting and you spoke 90% of the time and the customer spoke five to 10% of the time. And those never ended up in them transacting with me that it always ended up in a great, thanks for your time. Probably never speak to you again type thing. But when you actually sit back and listen, you one, you will learn something about the customer and the person that you're meeting with. But you, you, if you don't listen, you run the risk of missing out on a particular problem that you might be able to solve or, or an issue that they're having that you can fix, or even at least if your product or service can't fix it, you can at least re refer them to something that can. And I think as salespeople, the best sellers are also the advisors because you can, if you, like you said, Simon, if you're leading with cost or price, you, and that seller gets commoditized very easily, right? Because you'll just mm. go, that prospect would just go to the next cheapest product or service that someone else is offering. But if you're an advisor, if you're adding value, if you're adding insights yeah. and genuinely caring and helping that business, that's much harder to replace than someone that's led with a price-driven strategy. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So look, we're getting to the top of the hour here. And I know Simon, you've got a hard stop in a few minutes. If we think about the top recommendations for you know, hardened salespeople to run their prospecting or someone stepping into prospecting for the first time, what are the two or three things that we'd all recommend that they focus on? So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll finish up with Ralph, mate. What are the two or three things that you focus on for a new startup? And look, I think start with preparation. Know a little bit about the person you're calling into and be genuinely curious to listen and hear what Ralph was saying before. Don't do all the speaking, do a little listening. The other interesting trick I've learned over the years is make a mistake. Uh, be vulnerable. And it, it sounds interesting. Why would I do that? I'm, I'm a seller. I want to prove that I know everything. I'll never forget a, a deal I did um, when I was back at SAP. I presented a, a solution to a client and they said, this is the value chain of what I'm going to do for you. Here are the problems I'm solving. Here's my understanding of your business end to end. And the, the CIO leaned in and said, look, you've got a good handle on it. You've missed an entire chunk of my business. Now, I knew it wasn't there. And in hindsight, I'll pretend I knew that I'd made the mistake on purpose. But what was interesting is I left something out that was clearly really important, but I didn't talk over the top. I didn't push my agenda. I basically, I shut up and listen. And the nuggets that prospect was giving me about what I didn't understand yeah. about their business turned to be the actual kernel of the deal I ended up selling. So don't be afraid to make yeah. mistakes is probably the other piece. And be humble and admit to them. And look, you're never going to know your prospect's business as well as they do. And as you said, Dan, most people love talking about their job, their life, and their business. And if you shut up and listen, you're going to learn an enormous amount in terms of how you run your sales cycle. Yeah. Before I ask you, Ralph, my, my two points, I think that exact point, Simon, um, when you prospect, don't be afraid of it. If, you're, if you are in business, you are always prospecting because it's about the people we meet, it's the connections we make, but you dealt with them before or, or it's a connection mm -hmm. of, we are never that far removed from somebody. So that's the first piece. But the second piece is talk to people. Just be really conscious that you are not one business selling to another person, another business. You are always one person selling to another person. It doesn't matter what role or title they've got. It doesn't matter whether it's your first day on the job. They're the CEO of Qantas. Who are, they're just a person. They're not better. They're not worse than you. It, it's Absolutely. just a person you were talking to on the other end. And the more you make those connections, the better your results will be. 
So Ralph, mate, what are your two recommend, a couple of recommendations? Oh God, I'm going to struggle to, to narrow it down to two, but I'll, I'll start with what I spoke about at the start of this, the potty was mindset. It really is about mindset. It's about understanding that your product or service is going and telling yourself and convincing yourself that your product or service is going to help the prospects that you're trying to get in front of. It's not, oh, I'm going to bother them or I don't want to bother them. It's no, you're helping them win and succeed. I love, I love looking at the businesses that I've done not business with per se and seeing that I've had a genuine effect on their operation, whether it's building efficiencies or reducing their risk or just making them run a lot better as a business. It's really telling yourself that you know, I have the means to help you as a business. So that's what I start off with is mindset. I think that's really important because if you just think about, oh, it's all about the money and I'm here to make money and you're going to buy off me and I'm going to make money. Again, like I said before, you can really sniff those salespeople from a mile away. So it really is about being genuine and having the, the right mindset going into that call because that will come across in, in everything you do, whether it's the meetings, the phone calls, the emails as well. Mm. The second piece is it, the resistance piece. It's don't just give up the minute the prospect says, no, I'm not interested. Your mindset should be like almost like a child. When a child hears no, they go, cool, I'm going to do it anyway type thing. So I think really just having that hardened resistance to you of going, cool, it doesn't mean no now or it doesn't mean no forever. It just means no for now. So really just have that dog with a bone mentality when you're, when you're either in that prospecting call or meeting or when you're trying to get in front of that prospect. And then again, the purpose is getting the meeting. It's not to qualify or get the opportunity to get the deal. It's get the meeting and then focus about focus on the other, that other stuff later. And then you can, then you can either drop that prospect or focus another time. And then finally it's pick up the phone. That's really what I want to is hone in on is yeah. yes, there's the, I, we call it the omni-channel, right? There's again, there's LinkedIn sending a carrier pigeon, obviously say that facetiously, but email, Twitter, but picking up the phone is still the fastest method uh, to get the attention and the meeting with a prospect. It, it's still the most effective and fastest way, right? And to your point, I think it was Dan or Simon or both, it puts a human behind the sales effort, right? I think it's very hard to come across as a genuine, normal human being over email or over a LinkedIn message. But when you talk to someone on the phone, mm. it comes across very clearly. So I think for me, phone is... It, People say it's old school or whatever, and it's people, it's the phone is dead, but it's really not. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of, sadly, I see a lot of up and coming sellers still think that the phone is dead and that LinkedIn's the best. But if I go back to my point before, what are you going to do when times are tough? Are you just going to do a hundred LinkedIn posts a day? Probably not. But what I can tell you is going to be effective is picking up the phone and, and getting in front of those customers that way. So I could go on for days, yeah, but those would sure. be my, my, my key for you. Yeah, for sure. Ralph, mate, that's been amazing. I think it's been a good wrap up of prospecting and I hope everyone gets some value from it. So for everyone who's listening to the podcast, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Growth Pulse, the B2B Sales Podcast. We've got some amazing guests coming over the next couple of weeks. So please be sure you've subscribed, you've, you've followed us. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, click the plus sign. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to the like button down below. Thanks for the, an awesome podcast. Thanks, guys. Again I really enjoyed that. Thanks, guys. Thanks Ralph. Have a great Thanks, one. Yeah. That was awesome. See you guys.